Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, first talk of the semester by uh, PLPDG on a, on a very topical issue. Sure. Public Law and Policy Discussion Group. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and it, on a very topical issue, I'm sure all of you read about it in the papers and uh, understand bits of it and don't understand most of it, uh, of what, what arguments are being made and what the fuss is all about. Um, uh, and, and truly, there's nobody else better to speak about it uh, than Dr. Usha Ramanathan. Um, I'm sure most of you, or uh, some of you, uh, read her work on Aadhaar and have read her in Law and Poverty and uh, other courses. Uh, and is undoubtedly India's leading researcher and writer on the issue. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, hand over the mic to Usha. And, uh, Usha, if you could just uh, speak for about 45 minutes and we take questions for 45 minutes after that. So we'll wind up by five. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and just just a uh, request, um, do not hesitate to ask very fundamental, simple sounding questions about this because there's a lot about this that you need to understand to understand the constitutional ramifications of uh, what is happening, and I'm sure I'll take you through uh, uh, most of those aspects. But and and the I, very idea of organizing this was to clear uh, much of the confusion you might have, or get clarity on many of the concerns you might have uh, on either side of the debate. Uh, so, Usha, thank you so much for coming at such very short notice uh, to the campus. I just want to say that, I mean, I, I'm going to second what I'm. Anup said now, there's no such thing as a stupid question, okay? So please ask anything you want. There can be a stupid answer, but there's no stupid question. Just ask. What I may do is just say, see, there are various different ways in which I could uh, talk about this project, but I think maybe because the case is on, I'll uh, focus, I'll try and say it through the case rather than through the project, yeah? which makes it somewhat different. Because there are certain things, and that as lawyers, it's important to recognize that there are certain things that are fact that make a difference to the policy, that make a difference to the kind of project we have, but they are not evidence before the court of law. It's very difficult to produce them as evidence before the court of law. What that is, we'll talk about later. But we'll talk about what is being said. I'm so sorry, is it okay if I bring coffee in your presence? <laughs> If you sleep, it's okay. If I sleep, it'll be bad. So, what is this case and how did it go to court? Very briefly, the project started in its present form in 2009, uh, January. Uh, and in 2009, middle of 2009, it started getting active. In the sense, things started happening under the project. There were certain basic decisions that were made. One decision made in this project was that it would be, it would not be a card, it would not be a smart card. It would be a number attached to a biometric. So there is this, uh, the UID, when they say Aadhaar card, there is no such thing as an Aadhaar card. It's actually a number attached to a biometric. The card itself has no sanctity at all. And one of the reasons, and there are many reasons why, one reason just to explain simply why this card has no validity at all. It is, uh, this whole project is done through an outsourced method where the, there are certain set of documents, about 18 and 33, I mean, there's a set of documents which are used for proof of uh, identity and proof of address and date of birth. Now, these documents are the only ones that are relied upon and they are only verified by people who are contracted to do this. So it is not, there is no government agency, there is no such thing involved. And there is no verification of what those documents say. See, when you have a, get a passport for instance, when a cop will come to your house and they'll, they'll check whether you are in fact there or not, and then they'll check whether, there is, whether you have any criminal cases pending against you. Uh, if you go for a driving license, you will be present in a government office, and that's how you get your driving license. So they, they give you, the driving license today is proof of identity, it's not proof of address. 
So that's a that's a bit odd too because they they depend upon an identity which is a piece of address. Otherwise, there's no logic to giving that address. Uh, but so there there are ways in which you are physically or even if it is document verified by certain agencies who are there with the government. In this project, there is no such thing. So there is no verification. There is, you give a document, they take the document. Also. There is no verification. There is no nothing. And this document that you get, it's called a letter. It's a letter that you have intimating you that you've been issued a number and that this is your number. Now, this letter that you get is not a signed letter by you. Know, nobody in authority signs that letter and says, I take responsibility for having issued this. So as you know, you can download it from the web. You can just go to the website. If you have basic information, you can download, you can print it out, and you can use it. So it doesn't, it's not like any of the other ID cards that you have. Right? So this is not an ID card, first. Second thing that you need to, and which means it's dependent on biometrics. We'll talk briefly about biometrics in a bit. The second thing to remember is that this project is actually in three phases. I mean, there are three kinds of ways in which this project works or is expected to work. The first is as an identity. So it may be a number attached to a biometric, but it's supposed to be an identity. But for it to be an identity, the basic requirement is that you should be able to control the ID. So if you have your driving license, or you have a passport, or you have a voter ID, you can show that card and say, this is me, and you put it back into your pocket, right? So that is the primary requirement of an identity. The second part of, uh, you know, the second thing that this project perhaps produces is identification, which is different from identity. So when they say, I, they, in fact, the project is not a unique identity project. It is the unique identification project, which means that there is a database. That database has certain information about you, both demographic information and biometric information. And when you want to establish that you are who you say you are, it is done by that database. It identifies you, <coughs> and there are, that is the first step of identification. The second step of identification is where you are asked to see your number in multiple databases so that other agencies can identify you on that database. So the first is identity, the second is identification, and the third is that it is an identity platform on which many people can build in a modern day language, I'm sorry, I'm too old for this uh, kind of language, but you, on which you can build many apps. It sounds, you know, by identity, sounds kind of too frivolous when I think of apps being built on it, but that's what it is. The third is that it's an identity platform on which many apps may be built. So these are the three, uh, you know, three ways in which you look at this project. Then there is another set of things that uh, that you may want to look at. The first is that you have enrollment. When you go and you enroll for, an, for a UID, right? So you enroll, you give your information, it is all, you give your biometrics, it's taken on the system, it is sent off, and then it is what they call deduplicated. And then they send back the number to you if they find that you are not already on the database. So that is the first process of enrollment. The second process that you have is of authentication means that every time you want to use the ID, you have to be capable of authenticating yourself on that. So if the authentication is done through the biometric, then you give your UID number, you give your name, you give your biometric, the system will say whether you are that number or not. If the system says you are not that number, then you are not that number. But that is the second stage in this, uh, in this, in this process. Once you've enrolled, the next thing that you're being asked to do which is not part of the act, is that you're being asked to see your number in every data, in multiple databases. You have to see it in your college, you have to see it in uh, you know, the UGC or whatever, you have to see it in a bank, you have to see it in your mobile phone, uh, you know, whoever, you, whoever is servicing you. So you have to see it in all these databases. That's the next part. The third part is linking. Sometimes, uh, you know, since the language is still evolving in this project, Seeding and linking sometimes tend to be conflated, but there are two separate processes that exist. So when you, for instance, seed your number with your bank, that number will then, the bank will then, they get what they call coerced consent. No, they don't call it that. I call it that. Because you have, if you see the seeding document that you have to sign, 
when you are giving the number to the bank, that document will say, I voluntarily consent to giving to you giving this number and to using it for NPCI. NPCI being National Payments Corporation of India, which is a private company set up under the Companies Act. It's not national nor India. It is a company set up under the Companies Act, floated by banks. And all these UPI, B, all these come to NPCI. That's another whole different story, which is going to be, you know, it's an integral part of the UID story. But I'm not sure how much of that will get said in the court. We can discuss that separately. But that linking that happens, so when you give it to the bank, the bank will then link it up with the uh, NPCI. So there are multiple linkages, like when you give it to your college here, it will be linked with, you know, with uh, UGC. In a school, it will be with CBSC. So there are you only seed it in one place, but then it goes on to other places. There are two kinds of seeding that this project recognizes. One is called organic seeding, and the other is called inorganic seeding. Organic seeding means that you go and you give your number to a database, and you tell me, please put my number into this. Inorganic seeding happens when, for instance, you have a voter ID. The election commission decides to check whether you are perhaps already on the UID database. So between the UID AI and the election commission, they try and verify and match and see, okay, this person's name is this, this is the address, this is a father's name or mother's name or... So possibly the same person and then they can inorganically, which means that you don't get in the way at all. It is being done and you don't have to worry about it. So basically you don't worry about what happens with your ID. It will be done by somebody else and that's part of the book. Hello, sir. So that is the uh, that so this is the other part of it. Right? You might, so you have uh, the seeding and then the linking also happening. So this is broadly one set of frameworks in this. When the project started, the project was in the if you look at the first document that was produced, which you can call some kind of a project document paper. It's called a strategy overview document. This was uh, produced in 2010 and it was put out in 2010 April. This document sees this project as a process by which they are going to give ID. In that document, it starts with saying that there are many people in this country who don't have IDs. And the idea is to provide IDs to those who don't have IDs. So that's the first part of it. And they say that that will help, especially for people who are entitled to benefits and subsidies and services from the state. It will help them identify themselves to the state. Then at another part, part in the document, it says that enrollment is voluntary. However, any agency might ask that you have to produce the number, in which case, of course, it becomes mandatory. So they make it mandatory. They say UIDAI is not going to make it mandatory. But enrollment is voluntary, yet it might become mandatory because some agency requires you to, uh, to have the, uh, to, to get enrolled on. The third part, another thing that we find in the document is that it says that the idea is slowly to bring this project up to steady state, at which time the, the government will no longer be needed. So if you, those of you who, all of you use Google, right? Do you know anything about Google? So when you use things and you know that they are data aggregators, when you know that they are people who seem to know more about you sometimes than you know about yourself, they remember things about you that you have forgotten or even want to forget. And it's useful to just do a little bit of scratching of the surface and see who Google is. So I'm not going to tell you that now, but it's, an, it's a worthwhile exercise to understand. Just to know who they are. This much I'll tell you that Google, like the internet, came out of the defense project in the US. It's not like it was some product that was made outside by some technology company and then it came. It is a way in which what is produced by the state then becomes private. And then that private produces its own its own rationale. So just go and you know, read about Google and see what it is. So here too they were looking at it reaching steady state, after which they would be able to make their own money. So they have a chart there of what are, what are the kind of authentications for which they will be collecting how much money. At that stage, the idea about authentication was only to authenticate the identity of the person and nothing more. So you find that we've passed through three stages. The first stage where we were talking about a, a link that was to be made, a connection, not link, I couldn't say link, but connection that was to be made between the National Population Register, which 
which was to be made, it's actually the National Register of Citizens. The first stage is the National Population Register under the Citizenship Act. So in 2000, uh, in 2003, 4 they amended the Citizenship Act and introduced Section 14A, and that Citizenship Act requires the uh, not requires, but it, it says that the state can create a national register of citizens, and if it is to do it, it will be done in accordance with the rules. The rules are 2003. So just take a look at the Citizenship Rule. And that's the, uh, when the UID project came in, the idea was that the National Population Register would do the actual enrollment of people. And the uh, UID AI would help in standardizing governmental databases. Since the National Population Register was still, exercise was still to be started, they said we'll do it along with the National Population Register starting off. That was to be in 2010-11. The UID AI, however, got impatient and therefore they didn't want to wait. They got themselves permission from first the Prime Minister, from the Prime Minister's committee, and then in, by October of 2009, they had established a cabinet committee on the UID, which gave them permission in the first instance to enroll 10 crore people, and then to enroll, uh, enroll 20 crore people. And I'm, again, there are, you know, it's a little like a story within a story within a story. So it will take something like not yet 1001 nights, but quite close to it. So I'm not, I'm going to leave many unstarted stories, but just indicate that there are stories there, yeah? So just take a look around 2012, what happened between the UIDAI and the Home Ministry, and what kind of decisions were made. So it's an interesting, it, it's one of those things where, uh, who, who was it? It was, who were the two nuclear scientists who met and they said that for 10 minutes they went out walking, and we don't know then, I think Bohr and, uh, Niels Bohr and, Two of them went out and, you know, it's like a mystery till today what happened in that 10 minutes because it could have been critical <coughs> to world history to know what happened in that 10 minutes, what discussion they had. So you'll find, and nobody knows. So many plays are written about what could possibly have happened. I think we'll have many such stories in this where we only have to hypothesize in what could possibly have happened given what happened later. So you have, you know, this is this is one process. Now, in two, till... I'll skip all the stories about biometrics and all of that for a moment and move to 2012. Actually, in 2011, September, for the first time, the, the uh, Petroleum Ministry said, we are going to make this mandatory for people to get gas cylinders. So the story about mandatoriness is a central part of how this has gone on in the court. In, when they did it in 2011, the numbers who had been enrolled, the numbers were quite small. So plainly that was one reason they pulled back on the decision in 2011. But also there were a large number of people who wrote into them saying, what on earth are you doing? You can't make it mandatory. We are all already collecting our uh, you know, gas cylinders. What is the logic of this project? Can you please explain it to us? It wasn't explained, but it pulled back on the decision. It did pull back only temporarily. So you find that in 2012, Large numbers of people, large numbers of states, agencies started uh, advertising that to get any service, to get a multiplicity of services, you would only be able to get it if you were uh, enrolled and had a number, had a UID number. If you were not on the UID database, then you would not be entitled and you reveal that database, whatever the database offers you, you reveal it to that agency and they seed it. That is when you will get your service. So if you look at Delhi, Delhi had said in December of 2012 that the revenue department, the revenue commissioner had issued circulars saying that for any service that is to be bought through the you know, revenue department, you would have to give your UID number, otherwise you do not get that service. So what kind of thing? You can't get a caste certificate, you can't get a domicile certificate, you can't you know, register a will, you can't... Uh, Register a rental agreement, you can't register property, you know, any transaction, sale, and uh, purchase of property. You can't get married. Before you get married, before you swear an oath to each other, you have to swear to the government. And then you collect the number, and then you go and see your number, and then they will consider getting you married. So this is the, this is what happened in 2012, December. Till then, there were, by then, there were already anxieties about what this project was. So in 2000 and, 
nine, when they first started having civil society meetings on this, people started raising questions saying, isn't there a privacy element in this? How are you dealing with the privacy element? That was one set of questions that were asked. Another set of questions that were asked was, what is this? This seems like you're creating a ground for surveillance of a whole population. How is it that you think it's all right? What is this? What are the protections that you're offering to people when you do this? And why do you even need it? The third set of people were saying that if you're going to make identity a primary basis for getting entitlements, then you are in effect going to exclude many people from there from what is rightfully theirs. The entitlements that are theirs, you're going to exclude them from it, especially when they saw that you're creating a, an identity, supposed identity on the basis of biometrics. And biometrics itself is untested technology. So the and even to the extent that people you know, knew about fingerprints, the problem was that the working classes would have a particular problem, the rural would have a particular problem, and people who are working, I mean, in various kinds of ways, and manual workers, of course, would have definite problems if you're going to use fingerprint as the basic identifier. So how will they authenticate themselves? And they get excluded from it. So there were, this is the way in which the original thing started, saying that why are you bringing in a project like this? In September 2010, they started the enrollment, UITAI started the enrollment on 29 September 2010. In the meantime, there had been a group of eminent citizens who had been in conversation with each other, facilitated by others who were outside that, who were not so eminent, uh, who had, you know, who were uh, asking questions, for instance, like, where is the feasibility study for this? What is this project? You can't come and tell us all if you give all your information, including your biometric information, without our knowing what this project is about. So will you please give us a feasibility study? What about the question of privacy? Is there any law that has been made at all on privacy? In the UK, in 2010 May, the UK which had started an ID project, a similar ID project, had decided to abandon it. In fact, in the UK, unlike here, when the, the political party, the conservative party, before they won the elections, as part of their electoral platform, they had said that we, if we come to power, we are going to scrap this project. And why? Because this is a case of intrusive bullying by the state, and we will not espouse it. So it's a kind of, it's a liberal argument where you say you don't want the state to be in your face and with you all the time. That, you know, face, uh, state, move off, back off from us. Allow us to live in, live in some freedom. So that was the logic there, but they had said that if they come to power, we are going to scrap this. They came to power and they did scrap it. So the question that was being, and there were multiple places where you had seen that, uh, for instance, in Philippines, they had said that you can't start a project as a, a project of this nature where fundamental rights are affected. You can't start it without on just an executive order. The executive can't decide that it wants to collect all this data and keep the databases, and the court in Philippines had said that you cannot do it and had therefore stopped their project. So it had happened not only in, you know, in UK, and it had also happened in an Asian country. So there were multiple questions that arose about this. At that time, the talk was still not about technology broadly. The talk was still about the use of biometric technology within this project and the creation of a database. In 2012, so uh, actually the, the, the 17 of them, including Justice Krishnaya, Justice A.P. Shah, uh, Professor Upendra Bakshi, S.R. Shankaran, Aruna Roy, a range of them, 17 of them, Kanaviran, they'd all signed on to this document saying that please do not start this project till you have at least done the basics. First of all, produce a feasibility study, tell us what it is, give us, you know, where is the, you know, how are you going to protect privacy, you tell us how you're going to protect privacy. Uh, and will you please consider why this is any different from other countries where they've decided to abandon it? Now, and similar kind of question. So they had issued that statement on the 28th of September 2009 because they hurried up to say it then because they had said that they were going to start the, enro uh, the enrollment process which meant collection of data on the 29th of September 2010. And then in 2012, by the time this came in, in, uh, in uh, on the 6th of May 2010, there was a meeting at the Planning Commission where civil society members were present, others were present, YDA was present, and they were saying, how, how is it that you're starting a law, uh, starting a project like this without a law? How can you not have a law? 
And if you look at the do documents that preceded this, you'll find that those did say, those did acknowledge that a project of this nature would need a law, but they said we'll come to it later. So this is a new uh, way of thinking, which we discuss again separately, because it has to do with the white paper in Justice Sri Krishna committee, which is working now. It has to do with that. So we won't step into that too much now. It's connected, very clearly connected, but we won't step into that at this, uh, at this point. So in 2000 and, uh, no, in 2010, they finally, on the, in December of 2010, after a lot of pressure from civil society, they introduced a bill in parliament in the Rajya Sabha called the National Identification of India, uh, Identification Authority of India Bill 2010. That was referred to a standing committee of parliament and that standing committee of parliament gave its report in 2011, December, where they after looking at the project and hearing multiple people, and I know that all of us sent, you know, we, had, we were asked questions and we had to send answers multiple times. So it must have done, been done with everybody. But they finally said that the, the bill is unacceptable. It just doesn't deal with the, with the issue at all. And the project too should go back to the drawing board. So they considered both and they said, this is not a project that can carry on like this. And this is not a kind of bill that can cover a project of this nature. So they asked that both go back to the drawing board and they said whatever has been collected <coughs> you know, till then, because they had started the collection in, on 29 September 2010, so by December of the next year, they said maybe you can hand it over, the government can see that it's handed over to the register uh, general, the census commissioner as we know them popularly. None of it was done and these have recommended the value anyway, in, you know, the standing committee of course have recommended the value. So they just went silent on the bill and nothing happened on the bill after that till 2016. Every time, however, there would be a hearing, there would be some, you know, it's like a little rat running around, you hear a rustling noise and you know there is something there. So there would be talk about the law like that, that there's going to be a law, there's been a little buzz and then after the hearing it will die down. So the law was never brought back to parliament and until <coughs> March 2016. In March 2016, where it looked like the final hearing might actually begin, the, uh, the uh, government then, first thing they did was to withdraw the bill that was already pending, National Identification, of, uh, uh, National Identification Authority of India Bill of 2010, which was in the Rajya Sabha. So because was the Rajya Sabha it did not lapse after elections, they withdrew that bill and introduced another bill in the Lok Sabha. But this time they introduced that bill as a money bill. Now please go and read you know, article 110 and around it. Uh, and I'll just tell you one or two things that are in this bill and then you can decide for yourselves whether it seems like it could, it could even in a, in a, by any stretch of imagination be a money bill. Read section 57 of this act and see that, look at the kind of changes. So I'll just tell you that and go back. So we, when we started, I said that it was to be linked up with the exercise that was to be undertaken as the National Population Register. Right? So it was at that time about determining citizenship. Because that's what the National Citizens Register of Citizens would do. So the NPR preceded the creation of the NRC. And that idea of citizenship got eroded quite early in the project where they said, no, no, we are not concerned about citizenship. We want to know all the people who are resident in India. So it will become a know your resident system. In that period, till about 2012, you find that there are documents that get produced and, and MOUs that are entered into, large number of MOUs with state governments, with oil marketing companies, with banks, with LIC, where they say that the MOU, in, in, especially with the states, say that you please collect this data, you know, the primary data that we want and give it to us, which is the KYR information. When you collect that for us, you can also collect additional information that you want. We only want to know the name, the address, the father's name, the mother's name, you know, and basically, of course, then it went on to becoming mobile phone, email address, bank account number, those came, you know, those kept getting added on. But they said you can ask for anything additional you want. So all the kinds of places where you might exist, whether it is, you know, you might have a driving license, you might have a health record somewhere, whatever it is, they said you want, you collect it, 
So the enrollment form would have part A, which would be our demographic information, part B, which would be our biometric information, and part C, which is called KYR plus. That is, uh, you give me the KYR and you get the KYR plus, you keep all of it. And in that form, there would be a thing which said that, do we have your consent? You know, you say, I consent to my information, both biometric and demographic, being given to service providers. And the default position in that, of course, was yes. So there are many people who have been complaining, saying that I said no, but it says yes. It can say what it wants, its technology doesn't have to listen to you. So that then becomes yes, and immediately that information, as was admitted by Mr. Avi Pandey, who is the UIBI chief at the Sri Krishna Committee Consultations, this would then, when they got the information, they would automatically give that information to the person who is doing the correct thing. In 2012, they produced a document, the UIBA produced a document on how to set up state resident data hubs. Now, these would be all the information would be about that, about persons in that, you know, who are covered by that hub, would be handed over by the UIBA, including biometrics till 2016, would be given to them. And they would then create their own database locally of all the people in their area, and they can keep on adding information, deducting information, whatever. These would be state testing data hubs, where the state would have all manner of information about you. So now, all, why I'm telling you all this is because all of this is in contest before the court. Not, this is not no longer the background. This is what is in contest before the court. In 2012, when they finally announced that this is going to be the uh, you know, this is going. This is the project, and you know they're going to make it mandatory everywhere. A large number of people went to court. In the meantime, in the meantime, um, Justice Putta Swami in 2012 had already made a made a petition to the court. In 2013, a large number of other petitioners joined the petition. There were petitions in different places. There were petitions that were pending in Bombay, in Bangalore, in Chennai. Uh, all of them were aggregated and you know, they were transferred and they were brought to the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, on the 23rd of September 2013, the court passed an order after hearing, after having heard petitioners over a period of time, they said, finally they said, okay, two things we can say. One is that no one should be denied any <coughs> service because they don't have an Aadhaar card. From then you can see the confusion. Is there such a thing as an Aadhaar card? Nobody knows, but that's okay. It's become irrelevant now. And the second thing that they said was no illegal migrant should be enrolled. Now, of course, who is going to decide who is an illegal migrant? Not every migrant is an illegal migrant. But they said, you know, it seems basic. So they started this process, and the moment they did this, they, the moment they passed that order, the UIDAI, among others, went back to the court with an application saying, please allow us to make this mandatory because this project can only work if it is mandatory. So after having said that this is a voluntary project, they went and told the court that the only way this project would work was if it is mandatory. Then in the, in the next few years, you find that many state governments respond to the court. There is a lot that happens in the courtroom. There are at least six times when this case is heard. And six times when the court keeps on reiterating and making stronger its order, and six times when the court continue, when the government continues to violate court orders. So they said, okay, if you give us, like we do, and I, mean, I know I did that as a child, I'm sure you've done it too. You ask for permission. If they give you permission, you act according to the permission. You ask your parents, can I go out and play? And they say, okay, then you follow their orders and you go. If you ask them, can I go out to play, and they say no, then you disobey orders when you go out and play. But you're going to play anyway. It doesn't matter whether they give you permission or not. Similarly, here you have a project that is carried on through all of this. So this is the rule of law, one of the elements of the rule of law argument. That you have a project that has been built up and a database that has been built up systematically on violated orders. Violation of orders. And then you expect that database to be maintained under a rule of law. How will you have that happen? So that's one, one whole set of things. So among the arguments that have been made now in the court, the I tend to foreground this, but this is being done by many people, and you'll hear it more and more, but it's not been the most foregrounded thing. It is of exclusion. 
Why has exclusion become such a big thing? Because the project has not rolled out in the places where the poor go to collect their uh, rations. They go there to get work under the NREGA. So it's PDS, it's rations, it's social security pensions. These are basic areas. And then EWS, if children want to get into the EWS quota, then they have to be able to have the, without the UID number, they will not be able to get on. And of course, now all children have to have, if they have to enter a school, if they have to do an exam, if they have to get a result, at every stage you find that this is becoming uh, compulsory. For the poor, therefore, that's the first place that they started rolling out authentication through biometrics. So you find that the failures of biometrics start getting shown there. I, I'm going to very soon put out uh, on some website or the other the list of dates and the documents that show that the UIDAI did not know anything about biometrics when they decided that they would adopt it as the unique identifier. And please take a look at the documents yourself. I think one of the problems in this project is that the bureauc bureaucracy of in India depended on PowerPoint recitations and did not bother to read the documents. It's the laziest way of doing administration. And if you read the documents, it's not what the PowerPoint is saying. So you will find something completely different, but you decide for yourself. I think these are things each of us, it affects each of us, it affects our liberties, it affects our freedom, and it affects the way in which we can organize ourselves or be, even exist as citizens. So it's important to read these documents, and law students, you should read them yourself. I will refer to only one, which was in 2010, January, February, when they were issuing a notice to a biometric consultant. And in that, you know, they were, this is 2010 January, which means not before they started, they were looking for a proof of concept to be done on enrollment. And in that document, they say that the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, after doing a 10 to 15 year study, had found that biometrics is affected by environmental and demographic factors. Environmental meaning if it's hot or cold or dusty or you know, any of those. And demographic, like if you're rural, urban, what kind of work you do, whether you're old, young, all of this makes a difference to biometrics and how they work. In any event, that report, although they don't say it here, the report itself says that it is biometrics is only probabilistic. It's not determinative. So if you're going to have it across a whole population of 1.3 billion people, I leave it to your imagination to see what it means. Now, all of us, of course, in a very often in a room full of people, if I would ask how many people in this room believe that biometrics, that fingerprints are unique only to you. Partly, I think it is the only kind of vanity we are left with now, if we can say my fingerprints are unique. But actually, when you ask, how do you know that yours are unique? Nobody knows. I was told. I read somewhere. That's how this whole project has been run. So this, that, just to remember, and in that they say that not only in India, but nowhere in the developing world has this been tried and tested. So we don't really know, but we have decided to adopt biometrics. So that's one thing to remember. The other is, I'll just read out some of the kinds of uh, broad heads of challenge before the court. Uh, one of them is the, you know, there is a basic relationship between the state and the citizen. And when you look at this relationship, you know that the state has is powerful, it has authority, and it has legally constituted authority. And it can decide you know, within that authority. Administering is administering the law. It's not administering a people. It's administering the law. And the law gives a certain authority and a certain amount of power to the uh, state and its, uh, the agencies of state. So in you know, our whole fundamental rights chapter, the significance of that chapter is not just that we have freedoms or that we have rights. It is that the state can't in, impinge on those rights except under exceptional circumstances which have to be explained and which have to stand the test of a judicial and uh, stand the judicial test. So it's not like okay, I feel today that you've had enough freedom. From tomorrow, you just stay inside, and that's enough. The state can't do that. So it is about uh, when we say it's about limited government, and it is the constitution, like we often say, is not about the powers of the state, but about the limits of the power of the state. It is that limit. That petitioners in this case are saying is getting impacted very badly, and that you're inversing, in, you know, that the, yeah, you're inverting it, where you're making the state more powerful 
over a people and making rights redundant. So which takes us to the second thing, which is that one of the arguments of course was on privacy. But in, you know, like I often say, it's not, privacy is not about just whether Anup knows about me or not. It is about personal security. And it is about saying that you can't deploy technologies in a way and you, can, you can't deploy <coughs> systems in a way where you, you decide that so much privacy is enough for me. It's not for you to decide. And as the discussion has gone on, we also find that information about myself, when we say information, it quickly gets converted into talk of data. And when we talk about data, we talk about property. But there are two ways in which this is approached. It can either be approached as property or it can be approached as rights. This now, we are in a, we are in a place today where we are poised in this, in a, in a, in a, in, in, in this place. So one of the arguments is around eminent domain. You know that, you know, for eminent domain, the basic doctrine is that private land can be taken for a public purpose on payment of compensation. Each of these elements has to be there for eminent domain. But we found that over a period of time, land that may not be private, that may be in, you know, that may be held by the state, have, have also tended to get <coughs> treated like it is, uh, like it, it's, it is the state's and the state can do in its territory what it wants. That has become the eminent domain principle. And that, that's not the original doctrine at all. So it has got, there's been an expansion of state power through this idea of eminent domain, but not this strict doctrine of eminent domain. So it's no longer about private land being taken for a public purpose. It is about the state being able to say, I think that is for a public purpose, and I'm going to convert all this land to that public purpose. So it's changed. It's become about territory and much less about this idea of a responsible, you know, of, a, of an answerability when you're taking private land for a public purpose. What we are seeing today, and this is one of the arguments there, is that information about us is now something that the state is saying it has an, a right, it has the power, it has the authority to demand that we give information about ourselves. And we have to give it. Because it is for a public purpose, it is for a National, it's for national purpose, national interest, it is for national security, and it, the public purpose could also be that they're going to give this, make this information available to various private players who are then going to produce wealth for the nation. So the, the project of the state, which today, for instance, you could say Digital India is a project of the state. So to further the interest of Digital India, you could say that, no, no, you have to give all this information because that's how that public purpose is going to be served. So the, the, the notion, not the doctrine itself, but the notion of eminent domain as it has evolved to give the state extraordinary power in relation to what it sees as its territory is now being shifted into a zone where all of us and all the information about us is also being seen as amenable to that kind of uh, assertion of power and authority by the state. So that is also in context in the in the court. The third is privacy. Now for privacy, the important thing in this is that privacy was being argued and in uh, when it looked like the, 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 you know, after about six, seven hearings, when the court was finally after two years, when they were listening, beginning to listen to the matter, the government stood up, the attorney general stood up and said the people of this country have no right to privacy. Now remember that they didn't just say it here. They, they didn't, yeah, they said it only here. They did not say it in other cases. They did not say it in the defamation case, for instance, where they wanted to strike down section 499. They didn't say it there. There they said the converse. They said, please don't strike this down because we, the people of this country have a fundamental right to privacy and we have, as a state, we have to protect their right to privacy. It didn't happen, you know, there was no gap of three years. It happened within a week. The same week, just down the corridor, but in different courtrooms. The same state. So it's not insignificant that they felt the need to do away with the right to privacy to keep this project going. The third thing to remember, the third thing is surveillance. There are multiple ways in which surveillance is being talked about in this case. Just to give you some of the kinds of terms that are being in use here, there is the idea of tagging, of profiling, of convergence of data, 
all of this and when they say, oh, the UIDAI doesn't keep any information, that itself is not wholly accurate because they keep what is called authentication data as often as you go back to it. But the UID project is not the UIDAI. The UID project is not the Aadhaar Act. The UID project is vaster. In that project, you also have the seeding of, you know, there are three words that I said this before here, so if you've heard before, I, mean, I apologize. The three words are unique, ubiquitous, and universal. The idea is that this should be a number that is unique. I don't know how unique it is, but that it should be ubiquitous, which means every it should be populating every database, ubiquitous, which will make it universal because you can't survive unless you have that number. Therefore, you will willingly have to get out of the database. So the ID, these are the three things that are driving this project. And there is the state interest where they create these data hubs, they create multiple ways in which they can look at, all of, you know, look at people through various databases. There is also an idea that uh, the, the, the project as we are seeing it today is not a state project. And this is the place where it's going to be difficult to figure out which of the evidence can be placed before the court and how the court will receive some of the evidence that's placed before. It is not a project that was driven by the state. It is not a project that is owned by the state. It is not a project that's being developed by the state. The whole thing is being done by private interest. And that's a whole area. So when you ask me those very smart questions, I'll give you answers to those. But to broadly tell you that uh, when you're looking for material on this, please look for something called India Stack and see what is India Stack and who is building up India Stack. You look at something called a fireside chat in uh, 2013 between Mr. Vinod Khosla, Nandan Nilakani, and Srikant Radhamuni. Just hear it to know the kind of plans that there are. Read the Credit Suisse Financials Report of 2016 and see what the ambition is for fintech companies. And just to give you some key words in this, and then I'll stop for questions after this. The key words in this, one of the things, one of the ways in the, 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 the idea is that everybody should leave digital footprints. Because if you if you don't leave, in China they already have it now, where they have what they call a social whatever index. So they're going to they're going to figure out who you are and whether you're worth what you, you know, what you're worth. Because they're going to check you on every, you have to leave your Footprints in the, if you don't leave your footprints anywhere, you are a character who is suspect or you will, have, you will not be served by the market at all. So where you may want, you, know, you may just want a water bottle, but you are irrelevant to the market, so you will just not be served. I'm exaggerating, mean, this is a little bit of fiber board just to explain to you what it is. But to tell you actually what it is, the first kind of product that they are thinking that they will bring in into this is the uh, is credit. So they say credit for small for the smaller people, it's very, it's not cost effective for banks to be giving credit to small guys. So if you are willing to reveal yourself, because they don't want to give you loan against your, they won't, they won't give you credit against assets, which is what banks do. They want to give it watching your cash flow. And now they have done away with the idea of consent and they have built what is called consent architecture. So have you heard of payday loans? That is if you have, you get paid you are paid for a job and they see that you get paid every month, then they will enter into an agreement with you to give you some money so that you can pay, they can collect it back on payday. It doesn't matter whether you have it, you know, you can't control it at all. The consent architecture will take it away. So this is way a few, many steps ahead of, uh, you know, those EMIs that you give checks for, which are post-dated checks or pre-dated, what pre -dated, whatever, post-dated checks. So this is like, many steps ahead and the idea is that this whole system should become cashless, that's one kind of thing, paperless and presenceless. Now RTI activists are often telling us if there were no paper trail, you would never catch any corruption. And today you find that doing away with paper and keeping everything as, in, in, as information in some other repository over which you have no control has become the order of the day. And it will be presenceless, which means that your presence is irrelevant. They don't want to know if you are there or not. <coughs> Basically, they only want your money. 
So the idea is to create businesses through this. And what is this new economic philosophy that has come in? It's called trickle up economics. <laughs> trickle up economics is where they say that the people of this country, they don't have any wealth. I mean, you, you must have read the recent Oxfam report where they are saying 73% of the wealth that was made has gone to 1% of the people. What about all the others? You still want them as a market? You still want to take what they have? This is also about formalization of the economy, where it's not about giving people formal jobs, it's not about giving people formal social security pensions, no. It is about their money coming into the formal economy. And that should be trackable. So that's where you leave your digital footprints. And trickle up is where you don't have money, but you have something that I want, which is data about yourself. So you reveal yourself, I will give you credit. I may give you credit. But if you don't reveal yourself, you get nothing. You get left out of the system. And there is no option of not revealing yourself because one place or another, they're going to ask you to come in. So this is the, there is a load that there is on this. The one report that I would ask you to look at just as a starting point is a report called the Tag Up Report, which was uh, produced in 2011. Most of the things I'm saying, it shouldn't surprise you that the, either the author or the chairperson or the person who is you know, who's speaking, who's the spokesperson for this, is Mr. Nelikan. Because he's at the center of this whole development. So it's not to, you know, I, it's to understand that there are different points of view and different spokespersons. And it helps to follow what they are saying so that you know what, what you know, whether to accept it or not and how you read it. So you need to know who the players are. This is the case that's going on in the court now. There are, for the money bill is under challenge. And biometrics is going to be under challenge. And I'll end with this, that all of the way this project has been rolled out, it is, you know, you have to justify it, right? How do you justify a project of this nature, which is going to be all encompassing? You have to put your number everywhere. If you get excluded, you figure it out for yourself. Because we have to protect the state. We have to protect the state's interest. So how do you then, you know, what is, what is, how do you characterize it? The people, therefore, have been characterized as people who are into so much corruption, money laundering, black money, terrorism, tax evasion, and a whole host of other things. You know, you, are, you go to the hospital. In Tirupati, for instance, they ask you to give your UID number because they are saying the same people come too many times to this board. I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. I'm just coming from agricultural college and we're just having this discussion before I came. So more than twice in a year, it's a little difficult for you to get. You have to give your UID number. I was told that in a in a temple in uh, Baroda, you can't enter the temple. It's it's like a it's a temple that you can walk through and come back. You can't enter it unless you give your UID number number. So there is a kind of insanity that has got into our system today, which is also under challenge in the uh, in the court. So what, I mean, what is it that, how, how, how is this being characterized? This is being characterized partly as the electronic leash, where because you can have a leash that will you know, control every person, you have this electronic leash. And the other is, which I, which I you know, it's, a, it's a recent formulation, I find it uh, explains a lot, which is about constitutional trust. You can't say... A state can't say, a state can say, but if it says, then it creates a huge problem for the constitution. When a state says that I distrust all the people, and therefore I want to see all the people all the time, when I want them to report to me, I want them to report to me, and I want to make sure that each of them, at any given point in time, is not corrupt, is not a money launderer, is not a whatever, whatever, whatever. That is a question of constitutional trust. Can you have a constitution? where a government says, or a state in this says, that the people are not to be trusted. Can you have a constitution at all after that? And can you have any kind of democratic space if it's going to be on the basis of distrusting, of you know, lack of, of the absence of constitutional trust being the basis of a project? So that's broadly the kind of argument. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of questions, and uh, and I guess you must have, if you hadn't realized already, uh, surely figure now that there's such a complex web of issues uh, of surveillance, privacy, uh, delivery of welfare measures, um, 
surveillance access, all of these questions. Uh, so I'll just open it up for questions now. Um, just identify yourself, just give me your name and uh, uh, who you are. And, you don't have to do it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> This session, you don't have to. Uh, so, yeah, i just take a few questions first, and, yeah. Uh, I'm conscious I'm in the floor here. So, uh, one question I have is, uh, the government, at least the sort of the PR machinery that is there, uh, what it pushes is that we need some sort of national ID to uh, control, uh, control and have a tab over which citizens are acquired under the subsidies or not. So, they're saying that subsidy access requires a national ID. Uh, and uh, because there is a lot of problems with government that there is a lot of people who move off the welfare and there is a lot of welfare problems. So will something like this even uh, just tackle the government? For instance, in my home state, Telangana, uh, the, what the government has done it is it has linked ration cards with Amo. And they said there is around 1 lakh, 2 lakh people who have been uh, using it. They had duplicate ration cards. And now there is no misuse. So will the national ID necessarily be sort of... <coughs> Does the government sort of consider this a national idea? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I am Shweta Miller Sorgha. I had a couple of questions. I would just hope you could elaborate a little more on the last point you made on constitutional trust and on the inconsistency of biometrics and how it's adversely affecting the population. said that the project is beyond the, just beyond the act. Act isn't the project in itself. And second, there's a lot of technicality involved in the entire process. I just want to know how much of that and to what extent is that open to judicial review? How much can the court intervene in the te uh, technicalities or even uh, the mechanisms which are outside the act? Okay, just before you answer those three questions, I can add a few points to the first two questions. In terms of this repeated argument about uh, we need this to fix the leakages in the PDS system, um, again, it goes back to what you were saying, that are we, approach, I mean, are we approaching this from the wrong end in terms of saying uh, we need to do whatever we can to try and plug the leakage, or should the question actually be the reverse, to say that should we not, even if one person is to be excluded from their PDS, is it then constitutionally acceptable to say that, should that be the question? We seem to be asking the reverse question that uh, in terms of just constitutional review, it's fascinating that that's the question and not the other one. We're saying that even if a single person, to ask the state, is there is there a possibility that even a single person can not get their uh, PDS benefits if you introduce this mandatorily? Second, in terms of the biometrics of the rural uh, uh, population, uh, could you also then speak a little about the iris scan? If you spoke about the uh, fingerprint and uh, that being subject to various factors. Um, uh, just for every benefit, if you could speak a little about the iris scan as well and address the question. Yeah. So the first thing is on savings and identity. Uh, the, the government has put out a number of savings claims. So they've said something like, Approximately about 60,000 crores, according to them, has been saved by using the UID uh, system. Of course, one first preliminary question which I think some people have been asking is, if really somebody has been siphoning off 60,000 crores, show us one FIR. Because they, they didn't just take it away from the state, they took it away from the poor. And somebody did it. The poor are not sitting there. If they had siphoned off 60,000 crores, they wouldn't be poor anymore. Right? So, the, who are these people? Why is it that they don't seem to be anywhere? You can't see them anywhere. So that brings us to what the savings claim actually is about. Now the and what the identity claim is really about. See, in the PDS system, which is where they introduced it first, in fact, it's interesting. You read all the documents over over the years, and you find that they, when the first meeting was held in 2010 on the PDS uh, adopting the UID, when that document was being discussed in the NAC, you had the Abhijit Sen and John Grace also there. And they read the document and they said, I am reading your document and I find that if you include the UID for PDS, it will help the UID because you will then be able to keep updating your database. But in what way does it help PDS? And actually you find that it simply doesn't help the PDS. Why? Because the way the PDS is done, 
See, when you give, every five years you have a revision of the previous operation card. Okay. How do you revise it? You make an application, people who are you know, below poverty line or people who consider themselves eligible make an application. And there are, like in Delhi, you have exclusion criteria. You have, for instance, if you have some two rooms and if you have a four wheel drive, if you're an income tax pay, then you're not entitled to patients. After you make the application, there is a physical verification that happens at your home. They come and they check whether, in fact, you belong to that or not, whether the exclusion does not happen. They find out how many members of the family there are. There is an, it's called intermediation between a state service and the people. What this project is asking, and that's what the Niti Aayog document, the three year vision document, or whatever says, is that now we need to have disintermediation. Why do you want disintermediation? Because if the administrator meets the people, there is corruption. Technology is incorruptible and technology is infallible. That's the broad logic. None of this is true. People actually, you know, for you and me who sit here and who just want to get on with our work, the system works for us, so we don't need to go to anybody for it. The poor actually need an intermediary, you know, an intermediary. With whom they go, the Tasildar has been a very important part of every, every one of these situations. Collector is a very important part. Now they've all pulled back. So in Rajasthan, when we went to see, for instance, when there was a pension, I mean, it's a complete hoop. How did they save money? There were 57 lakh people on various kinds of pensions. So there is social security pension, disability pension, widow pension, range of things. We suddenly found that, I think, 2.5 lakhs. Huh? No, 10 lakhs got struck off that list. I think 2.5 whatever, it's a large number, okay, it's in that. I'm just fading out today, but I'll get you the exact figure. When they tried finding out why these numbers got wiped out, who are these people? They, against many of them, it said dead. So the local people who work in Dev Dunghe area, the NKSS, they got that after a lot of struggle, they got out of them the list of people who were cut out from the pension system, social security pension system, and were declared dead. And they went back to the village to see if they are in fact dead. The first day, out of 11 people that they verified, 9 were still alive. So when you asked why did this happen, they said social justice and empowerment did not do their job properly. They should have gone and verified. They didn't bring back the other number, they didn't put anything here, so we struck them off the list. You have to give a reason why. So when we say that, and this was shown as savings, in Jharkhand, when the 11 year old girl died, they found that 11.5 lakh ration cards had been struck off the list. Many of them because they did not link their Aadhaar number to the ration card. The woman whose daughter had died, that 11 year old child, their family had ration card. But they were not able to link it to the system. They were declared to be fake and the ghost and struck off and nobody bothered to go and verify whether in fact they existed or not. In March, in May 2015, Telangana, you said, 22% uh, of the people in East Godavari, in, in, one, in one district, including Nenur and all of that. They found that 22% of the people had not lifted rations. They said, that's a very large number. Why would they not? Fortunately, there you have the uh, social audit team. So immediately they sent out the social audit team to find out why these people had not lifted rations, and they did a rapid study. They found that 50% of them had a problem with biometrics and a large number of them had problems with what they call Aadhaar mismatch. Because what is on the Aadhaar database is not the same as what is on the PDS database. So do get excluded from it. So I think, you know, we need to understand that this is a system that has been brought in, you know, like the, initially we used to say that this is a problem, it is a solution in search of a problem. See, you find it's not a solution at all, it's just a kind of you know, open experiment is being done on people. If biometrics does not work, what do you do with it? So all these have been shown as savings. They've also taken the idea of savings from a World Bank document. Now I must tell you, World Bank is a classic case. They had, this you will read in the paper, so I'm not going to read, but I'll tell you something else. So World Bank has a news, news magazine in which there are three experts who publish their paper, where they say that if you depend upon identity systems, Identity systems may find 40% of the poorest getting excluded from services. So that is the title. 
and it's put out and we of course downloaded, we had a copy of it, whatever, suddenly it vanished from the net. After some time it came back on the net, except that the title had changed. It said, reaching the bottom 40%. After it being an acknowledged to the 40, well, bottom 40% will get excluded, you know, could get excluded because of this. You're reaching them because they might, might get excluded. So, you know, we, we also need not to be too naive in saying, whose interest is this? If it is in the interest of the poor, the right to food activists are not going to be sitting and screaming their guts for a second. Because in the early, uh, late 90s and early 2000s, they were the ones who worked really hard to set the system right. Because at that time, the leakages were very high. That had already started getting set right. And by 2007, it had improved tremendously. Very good examples of how it had improved. Every state had improved. Now, to the, your question, now what, what they are saying is this exclusion. When you ask them exclusion, they say, no, 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 you read the act. The act says that if you give your uh, UID, if your UID does not work, they should give you the rations anyway. If they are not giving, it's not my fault. It is the local authority. But the local authority has been told if you give, it's going to seem like you are you're a corrupt person. Otherwise, why would you give it without the biometric? So, in fact, Tushar Mehta, I think, in in the in court was saying that from December 17, you know, sometime in December, we issued this order saying that no one should be denied, denied any rations. Which means for three years they've been carrying on with it, with denied rations. And the case is in court and being heard, and therefore suddenly the whole thing changes. So, let's get one thing clear. I think there are some of us who genuinely believe that the poor have been used as an experiment for biometrics to see if it will work or not. It doesn't work. There is a report that came out in December 2016 on the Wattel Committee report on digital transactions. That is for the businesses that are going to be set up, the fintech businesses. They have said that, that they don't want to use biometrics. Why? Because they say, oh, connectivity problem, that POS machine may not be of good quality. It's okay for PDS. You don't know how many places they have. In Delhi, there are people, there are videos to go on the thing, you'll find. Because the you know, activists say there is no other way of communicating to people. So they've taken this video that uh, dealer carries that boss machine and keeps walking. He goes up to a tree, then he's pulling it from a tree. Everybody has to go with him to authenticate themselves there. No connect. This is Delhi. So, and then they call it teething trouble. So it, there are some things that are clear that the Manmohan Singh government was not interested in retaining the subsidy structure. They, in any case, wanted to shift to DBT means that money will be put into the accounts of, you know, some money will be put into the account of people, which will then get spent in the market. The government had to get out of provision of public services. That's how they started. That continues with this government, with additional ambitions that have come. Ambitions of being able to see everyone, control everyone, it's what the, the lawyers have been calling, uh, the ability to switch off and to cause civil death. These are not perfect, I mean, it's... This is where we are today. So, you know, this uh, whole savings thing is a red head because it doesn't exist. The CAG, forget what I say, forget what World Bank is saying, forget what, you know, these other people have been saying. I'll just give you two documents and just take a look at them. One is an NIPFP document where you just go to NIPFP and you look for other, you'll find it. In 2012, see, till then there was no feasibility report. And everybody was telling the UID, what on earth is this? You're rolling it everywhere and nobody even knows whether it can work or not. And whether it will really do any saving. So NIPFP then does a paper in which they say that we don't have information. But if we assume that this is the amount of loss in PDS, and if we assume that this is the amount of loss in NREG, and we assume whatever else you want to assume, then over 50% savings we can make. So the question that was raised to them was, what is this assumption on what are you basing these assumptions? They said, no, these are moderate, <coughs> modest assumptions. So it's all right to make these assumptions. The government had no information when they decided to use this as an explanation for putting it into the system. So let's be, you know, that's why I'm saying as lawyers, lay people okay. As lawyers, what is the evidence? The evidence is not that people are corrupt. The evidence is that they, the system has no evidence. Right? And there is a process which is being short-circuited through this. The process is local. The process is through verification. That's being replaced by a centralized identity database. 
identification database in which if you are unable to link yourself at different stages, you have to be able to enroll, you have to get the number in your hand, you have to be able to seek that number, you have to make sure that your information and that is accurate. So it's a link. And then you have to be able to authenticate yourself time after time after time. This is the project. Would you be able to live with this project? If they told you that every day you come to college, you know, every time you submit an assignment, you have to put your thumbprint. If it doesn't work, you are not you. Will it work for you? It doesn't work for the poor. So actually, that's why in Rajasthan, for instance, it's 34 uh, percent you know, exclusion rate. And why is it 34? What does it mean? It means in 34 percent of the households, nobody's fingerprint is working. In the other 66 percent of the households, at least one or two people their fingerprint. Why is it that in Delhi, I found we had a public hearing on Sunday, last Sunday, and the tragedy of it, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you. But, you know, one of them comes there and says, Maine anguta lagaya. that did not uh, show at all, because it doesn't, acknowledge, it doesn't recognize her finger as a human finger. They were saying, you know, nahi gajar laga dete hai, ye wo so, yeah, please go out and see. That's why, you know, this idea of just rolling technologies over people without testing them is so dangerous. On biometrics, just a, a quick word on iris. Iris, see, fingerprint was decided for enrollment in the beginning. Then they decided without doing any test that they would just add iris. And they carried on using that for, and they say what a great thing we did. That's how we managed to get 90% or 99 or whatever percentage of the population on the database. We've given everyone a number. Then. But even then, in 2011, they said that fingerprint may be difficult because manual workers. This is not me saying it. This is the DG of the UIDA saying it, the front line in an interview. And then, in 2012, for the first time, they do authentication studies. And the fingerprint authentication report says that uh, uh, it will work, but if it doesn't work, it's, you know, it, it, all fingers may not work. So after you've enrolled and you've got enough, go and do a best finger detection. Then remember which is your best finger and keep it carefully. <laughs> and then if you don't have one best finger, you may have two fingers together they may work. So the best finger if you have, it's a green finger. You have two fingers which work together and you don't have a best finger, they are yellow <coughs> fingers. And the fingers that don't work are red fingers. So I think you should put this into the motor vehicles act, not into this project. <laughs> then they say anyway there is the iris. And then in September of 2012, they do an iris authentication study and they start with saying that iris never changes. Everything in the human body changes. So where do they get this from? And you see another study that is being done by a person who actually loves the UID because it's biometric based. Who's done the study where he says, you know, bio, uh, iris changes. The, where do you find this that it doesn't change in Wikipedia? <laughs> Why does Wikipedia say that? Because it was in the proprietary domain and it hadn't been tested across time. Intertemporal testing hadn't been done. So till it is done, you can assume anything you want. That's why you have economics. Right? Economists assume everything. Yeah? So now you find that in Delhi, they said that they're going to introduce Iris. In they haven't yet done it, but they've rolled out their like, EPOS machines everywhere. Now, when you do the iris, the iris too changes and the confidence level drops. So, what is that uh, researcher Ken Boyer said? He has said, not a problem. If it changes, you just have to re enroll. Mm -hmm. This is your technology. Okay? Now, I actually found at one time, although I don't use many technologies, whatever I use, I found it exciting. Now, I can't stop laughing when I think about it. It's and one question on constitutional review. Uh, constitutional this, uh, and question on whether this kind of technical details, if yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. can it what get yeah. into that? And there was a second, and the question of constitutional trust and how that yeah. connects to biometrics. Yeah. See, can the court get into what we have to see? Because the, the argument here is not about whether this is good or bad technology. This is about how policy is made. And I'm going to give you one illustration of how the policy, you know, how the policy is determined in this case. So you have, when the court said that you can't have, uh, you, know, uh, you can't make it mandatory, many governments came in and said, oh, this is a great project. So at that time, the Congress was in power at the center, and the Congress state governments were gushing about this project and writing to the 
writing to the court. So the Rajasthan government at that time was a Congress government, and the center you had the Congress. They wrote saying this is the greatest project in the universe and whatever. Then after some time, the, the they had in Rajasthan they had elections, so there was a BJP government there, and there was a Congress government at the center. But there was a further epidemic that was filed, in which they said very bad. <laughs> You're completely violating all federal rules when you do this, cannot accept. At least on this part. In a few months, elections were held, and at the center you had the BJP, which initially had said that they were not going to accept the UAE project. But then after they came to power, they decided to go with it. So then you have a third affidavit being filed by Rajasthan government. It says, yeah, project. <laughs> <laughs> all three are on the record of the court. And all three have been signed by the same joint secretary. <laughs> this is how, if, I mean, if this is how policy is being made, if we don't get into it, see, I, at this point, I I'm not a great one for working on national security, this, that, whatever. I do my petty, you know, small marginal groups. That, but this project, with the two major things that they have done, one is creating a database of a whole population, and the second is opening it out for businesses, and making them therefore so open and beefy, you know, the, they keep saying there has been no security breach so far. <laughs> so, and in you know, in Sweden, for instance, when they found that all their data had been given away and well, they hadn't realized it, it was a year and a half before they realized it. Now, here you have to have you should realize that this law makes the data controller, who is the UIDAI, also the data regulator. So they will decide, you complain, if they, if they do me a wrong, I go to them and tell them that very bad, I had a wrong done to me. Then they will decide who to punish for it, if they want to punish anyone. So when people went and said, listen, the websites are leaking, full of your UID numbers everywhere, they wrote to all the 210 websites, perhaps more than 210 are admitted, and said, be careful, what is this, don't let it leak like this. And then the people who came and told them it's leaking, they started figuring when you had the Tribune uh, reporter recently make, you know, may, uh, do her uh, expose, they hounded her. The problem is not her. Actually, we need people like this to tell us where the weaknesses in the system are, and they are refusing to let people speak on threat of punishment. So please think about it. I mean, and when how much of this can go into the courtroom? That's the question. It's a little difficult to tell how much of this can go into the courtroom, but I must say this, that there are so many documents on, you know, they are there. They are public documents. They are not technical documents. They are documents about the intent of the project and how it's being carried out. What is so technical about saying that when you collect the information, so you start with KYC, then you go to KYR, you go to KYR plus, then you come back to KYC, only this time it is not citizen but customer. So if you look at the act, they start with saying we'll have, when they told us, they said it will only be for identity and it's for authentication. By now we know that that identity part has broken down. Because if your biometric doesn't work, there's no way you can establish that you are yourself. If they accept your card, they accept it. If they don't, they don't. There's nothing you can do about it. So you have now anybody being able to go in and get numbers and anybody being, so that whole Jandan Yojana, the, uh, there's one, uh, a person in Pune, for instance, who's worked on these systems, who's been saying, listen, if you're going to allow money to move from a UID number to a UID number, you are creating room for money laundering. Please stop it. This doesn't require any great technical expertise. The court just has to be able to see that this is the way the project is being structured. If SRBH documents exist which say, for instance, there is a sub-authentication agency agreement, there's a format, and it says, we can't guarantee so the UIDA is telling the sub-authentication agency, we can't guarantee that the demographic information is correct. We can't uh, you know, guarantee anything in this database. You use it, I am not liable, we'll worry about it later. This is all open documents. And if there is one thing that lawyers and judges have been trained to do to read, I don't know about you, but if you have it, you should start now, to read documents. So I don't think there is anything hyper-technical about it. It's really about the nature and structure of the problem. And on constitutional trust, biometrics is a really long story. I'm not, I don't even dare start, but I'll just tell you one or two points in that. We start in 2009, 
where they have the biometric standards committee report, where basically they say they are only testing fingerprints, only for uh, enrollment. They check about 25,000 people. They find that 2 to 5 percent of them don't have biometrics that can work. And so they say maybe we can then get 95 percent of people enrolled, but we may need to have one more uh, biometric so that it can become 99.5 percent. But actually, if in 25,000 people it is 2 to 5 percent, when it is going to be uh, 100, you know, uh, 1 billion people, 100 crore people, it's not going to be the same proportion. It's going to be very different. So when you're checking, if I have three fingerprints with me and I have to check one against it, I can check it with greater ease. The same becomes 30 and then it becomes 30,000 and then it becomes 3 lakhs, you know, 1 billion. The, in the kind of uh, markers that you have, the points, the data, the points, the algorithmic points that you have, they become more difficult for you to identify. So that itself is not accurate. In 2016, you have Ram Sevak Sharma, who is now PRAI chief, who was then the UIDA chief. He says in a NLPFP blog that uh, we prevailed upon the Biometric Standards Committee to include IRIS. We knew nothing about it, but we said, please include. And that's the best decision we made. So this is considered to be a transformative exercise. So, and the evidence. Very interesting, 2016 he's writing, by then failures in biometrics are being reported from everywhere. It's not even taken on board. So this is not a project that is based on evidence. Biometric evidence especially has been completely put aside. Nobody seems to want to know. And you'll find that recently they've said they're going to do virtual ID. Virtual ID is fascinating. So they say, you know, if you're geeky, he says, even every second you can keep changing your number. So you don't give your UID number. What makes you insecure? That you're putting your UID number in every database? Don't put it. What you do is you use your UID number to generate a 16-digit number. That's a virtual ID. Then to that service uh, provider, you give the 16-digit ID. That will last for a period of one month or two months or whatever that period is. That will be there with the UID AI, but it won't be in these other databases. So UID AI can still you know, figure out where you are, what you're doing. And then, that uh, the uh, director, the general of, uh, what the CEO of uh, UIDAI, suddenly realizes and says, of course, there are masses of people in this country who will not be able to do this. They can go with their UID number. <laughs> so it's valuable for some, completely valueless for others. Then they come up with facial recognition. This is really fascinating. <laughs> facial recognition, you know, when they made the law and when they started enrolling, they just took the photograph because everybody takes photographs. They had explained, they hadn't at all explained, even on the enrollment and in the uh, authentication, they never did face. It was just presumed it's okay to take it. So you stand, they take photo, it carries on. Now they've said, they're finding that FDS is collapsing. So how do you show this up? You say they're going to do facial recognition. So how? Facial recognition they're going to roll out where they will, your facial recognition will work if there is one more biometric that also works. Now, if my one other biometric, suppose my fingerprint works, why do I need facial recognition? If my uh, OTP works, it's not a biometric, it's another system that they have, then why do I need uh, facial recognition? Why does facial recognition need this? So the, that's the question. So they want to see if they can introduce facial recognition into the system. So they are testing it now through this process. This whole project has been full of testing, or, and it's, you know, I used to call it an experiment on a whole population. I still don't know how to say it in another way, I should find a way. But like somebody told me, this is not an experiment, because in an experiment you have a control sample, you know, where you will have a feedback loop, you will have, you know, you will do a number of, they are doing nothing here. Acha, fail ho gaya, fail ho gaya, bas, carry on, yeah. This is the project. So, I think uh, one shouldn't be too distrustful of any state. And I don't care who it is. We can't be distrust, too distrustful of any state. But when the state says that it's going to use its distrust of a citizenry to do many things, it's not, you know, in the beginning, it's not about distrusting the state. You do trust it, but you do study what it says. If it's saying that they're going to use biometrics, you study what documents they give you. You don't blindly accept what the state does, especially when the logic, the rationale for it is that they don't trust us. This is no relationship between a state, a state and a state. This is just no relationship between a state and a state. We can have, we can have one more round of questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
for you. Yeah, certainly. So, uh, yeah. So, I think the argument from the state has been that we have spent quite a lot of money on this and therefore we shouldn't be calling this back now. Second of all, uh, my question is that can you think of a way that, there is, that an entire population requires an identity apart from something that's in the passport. So when I have my passport, it's there for uh, me traveling abroad. An identity like this, which is meant for just the purpose of identity and nothing else. So can you think of a reason why an identity of this kind is needed, which serves absolutely no other purpose, but establishing an identity uh, of a of an entire, let's say, the population? Um, I'm a David Martin, after I'm a first year student. Uh, my question is related to the data storage and information that is already collected through the Aadhaar system. Supposedly, Aadhaar is a concept, is to be invalidated in nature. What happens to the already stored data, considering that there are third parties involved? So right now, I may be uncomfortable with the state having my data. Later, I'll be uncomfortable with my state. Uh, later, I'll be uncomfortable with where my data is gone. Right? So how is that chain of responsibility and accountability to be established between the citizen and state? Keeping in mind when there is an external body like the UID of all already stored data that they already have right now. Just following the last question, Geo Telecom, which has millions of subscribers, there's a data leak in the previous year. The website is magic. In case where all the data was leaked, despite that fact, so what is it for UID, which is so certain of this biometric technology? Stop this mobile linkages to Aadhaar, uh, despite the fact that the security standards are not such specified or violated on a regular basis. Can I have one last question? So when you give so many so examples of explaining how the uh, double system is in effect, and how the government has been helping with the fact that it is imposing to include it on the speaker, it is still not clear to me exactly what is the what exactly is the motivation, what exactly is motivating the government to do, or what exactly is compelling the government to come up with such many such so many policies. Uh, one after one after <laughs> and uh, uh, for example, one can argue that the uh, main objective of the government is the uh, uh, collecting database, uh, uh, data of millions so that can uh, care to private data, as you said, for commercial purposes. And uh, another excuse would be that uh, uh, it, is, it is for the mass surveillance. But uh, it still, still is not clear to me exactly what exactly is motivating the government to do, do this so that it gives you so much that it, it is blatantly, blatantly coming up with. So many policies, one after another. When even when it there is so so much objection from from the people. Commonly, you, you see this. I don't know. It's a frustrating response from the court that keeps coming in terms of if you can give the data to Google, why can't you give it to the state? Mm -hmm. right? Or if you can give it to Amazon, or whatever. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, uh, addressing this, uh, I mean there are there are. Responses shouting. I mean, there are very obvious responses to the argument, which you just articulate that. Uh, in, and secondly, in terms of the purposes that uh, Anuj was talking about, there seem to be even you said, you know, corruption, money laundering, tax evasion, terrorism, targeted delivery of subsidies. It seems like it's meant to be everything and anything. And what challenge does it raise as, as in the case going on in the court from a judicial review perspective? When you're saying, what is the measure and how does it achieve what it says it will achieve, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a basic judicial review. This multiplicity of um, objectives just negates any possible, I mean, it, it weakens the judicial review argument so much because, because if you say one thing, they will throw another thing at you. Okay. That way, in terms of... Uh, and, and anything and everything is acceptable as a logic without having to establish that rigor of whether that can actually achieve that aim. It just it just seems to me that you just need to state the aim and and the court is unwilling to give it any rigor in testing that claim. Right? And yeah. So if I just start with the last, because it's a... Uh... In a courtroom, in a case like this, it is not two parties who are before the court. It is public interest petitioners and the government. The, the court naturally tends to try and see constitutionality in the actions of the government. So if you have to dislodge that, it has to be a much higher standard 
than this government has to give to continue with the work. It doesn't have to do too much to say, unless we are able to establish in you know, with some strength that this should go. So the onus really is on people who come to court, not only because they've come to court, but also because they are up against the state. There is a way in which the there is a deference to the uh, government. Uh, and saying that, listen, if they say that this is the way that they can stop pilferage and siphoning off, then we should let them do it. Who is the court to come in the way? Right? So it's not, this is why what's happened, the real problem in this case mm -hmm. is that there are two sets of things. One is the factual situation mm -hmm. and the other is the constitutional argument. Now to match these two is not as easy as it seems. Not because it's not there. Mm -hmm. But because this is really a new arena, it, I don't think ever before, it, even during the emergency, it was not about saying everyone is bad, therefore I'm putting them in. It was merely saying you don't have the power to act, lay off. Are you going to claim that you as the court have the power of judicial review? No, you don't have the power to intervene. Even there they did not say that the people did not have fundamental choices. They said whether they have or not is not your business because we've suspended the power. There's no access to the court. Here you find that there is a, it is an assertion of power over a people. And uh, uh, what is fascinating at this point is that we are really at a cusp. We are at a point where technology is changing the world. And all of us have adopted technology to quite an extent. And there are many parts of it that we have not questioned. We don't yet know that we need to question. We have not yet seen the dangers of many of these technologies. The companies, in fact, have seen why is Facebook running, you know, all over the place to say, oh, I have a privacy policy, I'm protecting, I'm protecting. Why? Because they know that the level of illegitimacy that they can have can completely kill yeah. their business. Google does the same thing. But if you look at things like the Internet of Things, if you look at artificial intelligence, and you find that artificial intelligence is expected to throw people off and become the actor and not have people as actors. And you look at the internet of things and you find that, uh, like uh, in one of the interviews where they say, you know your toothbrush, your toothbrush is no longer just your toothbrush. Your toothbrush, you you know, the, suppose there is uh, say one million, it's much more, I don't know those big figures, but one million dollar uh, worth of toothbrushes and dental things that are being sold and the, the, dent, you know, the dentist's business is some 50 billion. Then you want to know what it is that you can do to improve the use of these dental equipment so that you don't have to spend 50 billion on that. So what do they want? They want to put in a sensor into your toothbrush so that they can see whether you're brushing properly or not. And then you will get advice to say, you know, so there is a way in which this Internet of Things is saying what can be taken should be allowed to be taken. This project is part of it. Saying that if I can get my, it is there, why can't I take it? Your information is sitting there, you don't even know what to do with it. You don't even know you have that information about yourself. Let me take it. That is the logic. And that's the cusp at which we are positioned today. The project prides itself on being able to create a trickle up effect. The project prides itself that it can watch everyone. See, unlike in other parts of the world, where if you give information for one purpose, in uh, Germany, for instance, that, uh, on top of a toll gate, you have these CCTVs, which is only for toll collection. And for now, in that, in one of those, when the, there was a car accident, I mean, no, there was a chap who went in and killed the fellow who was in the toll room and went away. If they had been able to use that as criminal evidence, they might have been able to find the person and whatever. They said, we will not allow it to happen. Not because we don't want to find the man. But because the moment you allow for a leak, you know, for a shift away from the function for which it was kept, then we open up a can of worms. And we cannot do that. We have to protect the integrity of people. Otherwise, it will go all over the place. In India, this project is saying that the database exists. Why can't we use it for X, Y, and Z? Why can't I use it for company? I will make more profit. I will make, you know, we will become, we'll, be, we'll have a Google here. We'll create monopolies here. So, and the state, so this idea of function creep, which is a basic principle in, in data protection and privacy law, has already, it's not even in the imagination of the court. 
And if the court doesn't understand what it means to retain integral spaces, then we are not in a good place. So part of the challenge is going to be to tell these people that just because you have a database, you know, they, they turn around and say, we are a poor country. So one side we are superpower, the other side we are a poor country. And therefore we can't keep collecting data in different kinds of places. We have it in one place, let's use it for it. So that, you know, it's a violation of basic norms. And it, this is how power structures get, you know, keep getting created. What is also interesting is that they keep saying, so what is the way to deal with the problems that we have? Actually, there are two things that we've had. In the 1990s, we brought in the Panchayati Raj, the decentralized systems. Now, people like us who sit here don't even know what the Panchayat system is, and we respect, respect it even less. But in the, it's the Panchayat that does the identification of the old. It's the, you know, the Panchayat is involved in multiple kinds of things. It's why did we even get that far? Because they found that at the state level, they don't have the ability to reach people. Now we are saying, no, technology will reach everyone, people get out. It doesn't work like that. No? So the whole idea of the Panchayat where you have a relationship and where you start identifying needs and wants, and then you have responsibilities put on institutions which are going to deliver to them, that's completely broken with this. So to RTI. What is RTI? RTI is about making the state transparent to people. What does this project do? It makes people transparent to the state. It's as simple as that. It doesn't require brain and many axioms have been born in this project. So, what, the question about we've spent a lot of money. Yeah, so, pay to comply. The pay to yeah. comply. Actually, the pay to comply argument is, to my mind, is the weakest. If the court were to see what it needs to see. Because this is about an illegally created database. First. Second thing is, even if you want to say, okay, illegally created, it's okay, but we have the database. Uh, now what do we do now that we already have it? There's two things. One is not only do they have a database, they've also made sure that the number is in multiple databases. Right? You have to now start being able, if you want to protect yourself, and it is found that in fact it is a surveillance mechanism. It, it does surveillance, it does convergence of data, it does profiling, it hands over information about us to be transacted by various other people, and therefore this has to go. Then one thing that would have to be done from all those databases, you have to remove the number. First. The second thing is remember that these are across time. So if you do not stop using that number, if you stop using the number, you protect the future while you worry about what to do with what's, you know, what has already happened in the past. I don't know if you saw, I think yesterday's paper was saying how in Bhopal, for instance, they are not letting children out of hospitals when they are born till they get there, till they are enrolled for a UI. So things that would have been in the realm of the bizarre are now the new normal. That new normal cannot be explained by a data computer. So one is about across time, because right now they say from before birth to after death, you're on this list. And I, I mean, I was saying, you know, the only way in which the government can provide immortality to us is by not allowing us to be cremated. Without a UID number today, you cannot be cremated. You cannot be buried. So this kind of uh, collection of data about individuals and <coughs> gathering them in different places, and then allowing them to be used by various kinds of elements. In any cases, that's what I'm saying. That's part of the project. Those parts can be stopped immediately. There is nothing to stop. And the dismantling of it is a harder process, but like they did in the UK, you just have to do it. And to say that I have spent money doing something illegal, so you should allow for me to make it legal. Actually, it doesn't hold anywhere, especially if it's going to violate a range of fundamental things. And honestly, somebody asked a question about identity. This is no longer an identity. I mean, it was never an identity, but where is the identity in this? Tell me how you use it as an identity. What do you do? So you went to enroll, they sent you a letter of intimation saying that this is your number. So now what are you going to do with it? You're going somewhere and putting your thumbprint, and if the thumbprint doesn't work, or if it works, how many places do you want to go and read this in? In Surat, when they had that uh, scam, it didn't happen because they breached the UIDI database. That's no longer necessary. They are asking you to go and put that number in multiple places. Anybody can take that number. It's become the most insecure thing, this biometric. Not that way, really. Anybody can take that number. So, uh, Not just number, but also biometric. And, and the biometric data. And this is a man. As we all, most of us, feel that government is there and for, is the custodian for our welfare. Um, my privacy concern is that if somebody takes my data, how can he possibly misuse my data? 
to the extent of in the now the social security number doesn't even have biometrics in it. You know that every year the amount of you know, billions of dollars that get lost to identity fraud. Do you know what happened with Air 10? Forget about social security number. So here you had a system where you have to go and link your number with the mobile phone. Okay? So you go there, you give them your number, you give your phone number, you give your biometric, they authenticate and they say, all right, I'll put the number. So you come back home. Then what does Airtel do? Airtel two years ago got an Airtel payment bank license. They didn't start anything till now. This proved a good opportunity. People are coming to them and giving their thumbprint, giving their UID number. Now to open a bank account, they are saying UID number is enough. Your, your, the moment you put your thumbprint, you give consent. But they opened an account for you. They just forgot to tell you. But they opened an account for you. Now the system is that the National Payments Corporation of India is the payments company through whom. Okay. Now all this is collaborative, which is why you need to see the number of tentacles. Mr. Nilakani joined UID. Mr. So, Narayan Murthy is the head of NTCI, which is just being set up. Mr. Nilakani is visiting NTCI openly, and I'm not saying this is some great state secret. It's an open thing, but he's been going to the NTCI for him to teach them how to use the UID number as their basic identifier. So now, by now, they have a thing where the money comes from the government and is not deposited into a bank account number that you give them, but into your UID number. So how, what is the year? Where, where do they get the UID number from NPCI? You are not giving it to NPC. You are giving it to your bank. So you have three accounts. You have one IDFC account, the IDFC bank, the HDFC account. So you put you put your money into your uh, you put your number into your HDFC account. HDFC lets NPCI know that this is the UID number linked with this bank account number. Then on that NPCI mapper, you put your number with your bank account number. Then you go to your SBI, and SBI you have an account there, so you put your number there. They inform them, HDFC is booked out, SBI is booked out. Now you go to Airtel and verify, and they open an account for you and inform them. And it's replaced by Airtel account number. The, the government is giving you LPG subsidy. It will put it into the, how is it putting it from the government through NPCI into your UID number? Not into your bank account number. So it goes into Airtel. But you don't know that you have an Airtel account. It's gone off. So remember, there are three numbers. This is not new. This is something that is planned. It's been spoken about since 2010 when we were told that Jal Jangal Jamile, they don't know about. Roti Kapra or Makan, Bijli Sadak Pani are now Pase. What is now? Something that everybody wants is a bank account number, Aadhaar number, mobile phone number. Everything happens from number to number. That's why presenceless is so important. They don't want to see your face. They want what you have. So you know when I I work a lot with the state. So it's I'm not suspicious of the state at all. I disagree with the state a lot, but I'm not suspicious of. And I find now that this is not a state project because it, it, that's why I said read the tag of report in 2011. Read what has been said from before. Who promoted this idea of the ID project? Of an ID project, which will put everyone there. They are, you actually have in 2016, Mr. Nilakani is giving a talk in IIM Bangalore, which is sponsored by Swarajya and IIM Bangalore. He's actually saying, you know, Google started when they started government, it was all developed in the government and then it got private. And then they are making their money and you know, that's what. So, they ask him, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, you know, question answer session because the students there, one of them asks him, not even the students, somebody who's come there is asking him, uh, what about uh, politics? Will it allow for this to happen? And he says, uh, first they laugh a little and then he says, uh, politics actually the good thing is that in politics, in politics you're always looking backwards, you're looking at the back, what happened, you're looking at the past. We are concerned with the future. Nobody is watching what we are doing here. It's open. And he says, by either slay, uh, stealth or because no one's watching, we can carry on with the project and get what we want. This is the imagination. This is how they're doing it. So our job really is to watch. You can't tell, you know, you can't ask for great ethics and you know kindness towards the poor companies. They are there to do their business. 
That's the work of a corporation. So this, all I'm saying is shed innocence. Don't be innocent about this. Be investigative. Demand answers. Because this is not something that is happening where, you know, today you may or may not be able to see a movie. Which, which also, by the way, these days has become a serious business. I think of a time a long past. But this is about, uh, you know, who you are, whether you exist, and what a future is going to be. So I don't think we can, you know, if the court cases, one, for instance, in the court, one of the judges keeps having no problem with collection of the data. He says, collection is all right, it's only a question of use. I say, how can you just, you know, take, you come to me, you collect all the information about me, and you keep it with you, and then you say, I will keep it safe. I don't want it with you. What, what gives you the right to collect that information about me? So every time somebody wants something, they are the ones who have to explain. Instead, it's being said to us, you know, what's your problem if they just collect? They have a right to collect data. They don't have the right to collect. <coughs> and if you want to be able to continue to trust the state, this, the power of the state should be limited. When the power gets too much, then you don't have any control at all. Then you become a sub, sub you know, you become a serf in that state. You're no longer a citizen. You're not even a subject. You're not even a customer because they will decide what you can or cannot get. You're not even a customer. You're a target. Thank you so much, Visha, for uh, that uh, very detailed and uh, thought provoking session. And I think, as, as Usha said, it's, I think, the obligation of all of us is to really inform ourselves of what is happening. And in that spirit, uh, we'd be forwarding uh, an 18-part uh, series that Pusha wrote for the Statesman. 19, sorry. 19-part uh, series that Pusha wrote for the Statesman. And, and I hope you will uh, take the time to read and inform yourselves of what is happening. Uh, and develop your positions on that basis, uh, rather than sort of very intuitive uh, responses. And, and on the basis of that information, have discussions in your friend circles with your families and that's and and that's a way to be responsible citizens i suppose uh, free. Forget about responsible. Free. Yeah. if you want to retain your freedom you have to work for it right. so so don't i mean don't be uh, intimidated by the uh, technology talk and uh, and 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 all the uh, words that get used in this discussion but it's it's very important that you familiarize yourself with those debates and discussions, and I hope all of you will make that effort as uh, law students. Um, thank you, Usha. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out despite all the work on the case that's happening. Uh, and I do hope that all of you will closely